My name is Leah Bennett. I am the trauma specialist and family advocate at Harborview Elementary. Hi. Um, and I have been serving children and families experiencing trauma for 22 years now. Um, and, and so this practice and, and sort of the evolution of bringing it into healing centered practices um, with a strength based approach is really something that's been um, a passion of mine for many years. And I'm very thankful to have um, Marissa, who is a dear colleague, <laughs> um, who has taught me so much um, about the, the field. And I'll let her introduce herself. Thanks, Leah. <laughs> Um, so I'm Marissa Jensen. Some of you may have met me previously as the trauma-engaged uh, school specialist for Juno School District. Um, over the summer, I transitioned, and I'm now the trauma-engaged schools coordinator with the Association of Alaska School Boards. Um, you may have been to sessions today with some of my colleagues, Emily and Lisa and Connor, who all have presented at the conference as well. Okay. Front row kids. <laughs> You're going to carry your phone. Um, my background is in, in clinical mental health, so a master's degree in social work. Um, and I have been working thank you. <laughs> well, now for about four years in trauma and schools work. So uh, Leah and I have worked together with her role at Harborview and community work around kids on well-being. That's what we're here to talk about. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. Um, so our flow for today is um, we are going to do a quick introduction of everyone. Um, and then we're going to review ACEs as well as the, the positive childhood experiences um, that can protect our kiddos from the trauma they may experience. Um, some self-regulation tools and um, dive into the protective factors. And then we will use these decks of cards um, to practice telling some stories about ourselves um, that point to the strengths we already have um, as a way to build community. Yeah. Um, do we wanna do, do we wanna do? Yeah, okay, all right. Um, we're gonna do just name and pronouns since there's quite a few of us in here. Um, but we'll start in the very back and we'll just kind of work our way. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> so hi, my name is Asa Gerasa. So it's my fifth day here in the US. That's right from the Philippines. So uh, it's my uh, eighth year as a teacher. I have uh, seven years experience in the Philippines as a teacher, public and private school. So um, I'm hoping to do um, Engage more and learn more through this session. I'm Kristen Beckner. I teach at Joseph Valley. Um, I was a teacher before for five years at Anchorage, and then I was a stay at home mom for eight years. Um, and then um, now this is my second year. My name is Rebecca Wilkerson. Um, this, I mean, just come from Mandoon, so Chapman School District. This is I'm teaching K one there this year. This is my nineteenth year teaching in Alaska, born and raised. Teach at Glacier City Tishanach Glacier Valley. Music teacher K five. Kashaya Ach Saeed Lekadreinach Frank Henry Katas Yuhadosa. Um, I'm Frank Bekich, uh, playing it at Dr. Hill Middle School, and this is my second year. Um, I'm Sarah, my pronouns are she, her, and they. Um, I'm Sarah, I'm a Brett Billingham, he, him, um, Heritage Foundation, 
last five years in some educational stuff and the previous 30 years of education. My name is Emily Wilson. My question is for Bruce. Uh, pronouns, uh, she, her, and um, and we do. Uh, do we need education to teach teachers? We need to teach students. We teach each other. Counselor, my pronouns are she, her, and my school counselor at Hong Bay. My name is Amber. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm working at Parker View this week. My name is Terry Gentry. My pronouns are he, her, she, and um, I teach fourth grade at Saeed Gaskino. Previously, I taught on the Kenai, so um, in Alaska, I've been teaching for about 12 years. Uh, hi, I'm Scott Grant. I teach uh, English here um, down the hallway. Mm -hmm. oh, nice to see. I'm Shella. She, her. I teach here English and English. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Zen is Jared Owen, a uh, 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 Persons don't participate. Yeah, how many are there? <laughs> there's six. Okay. <laughs> we forgot about our Zoom. No, if you just want to invite them to talk, then you want to invite them to. Yeah. Hi, Zoomers. <laughs> um, we'd love it if you could introduce yourselves, um, just your name and pronouns, um, and more if you'd like. Hello, can say um, I had chicken sha I had the Dane Tan Yadi I had I my name is Andrew Martin. I'm the Clinket language instructor uh, this year for a pilot program to Douglas Indian Association. I will be teaching at uh Saik Gastineau Elementary and Riverbend Elementary. My name is Marcus Wilson. I'm here in the, with the Anchorage School District. Um, supposed to be presenting with uh, Garen, uh, so I'm not sure if I'm even in the right <laughs> session here, but this is the <laughs> one. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, I bet Nicole can help with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have somebody here that can get you in the right room. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Love the topic. Many years doing trauma-informed practices. Beautiful. My name is Melissa Udovitz. I'm calling in from Denial Land in Anchorage. She, her pronouns, and I work with high school-aged youth with the Alaska Humanities Forum. I'm Shelley Jambier from um, Northern Alberta in Canada, and I am very excited to be here. Um, Tanya Holly, I pronouns are she, her. I'm a para at, let me get this right, Kaksdegu-Wuhin, which used to be River Bend. Thank you. Thank you all. I kind of lost track of the squares, but <laughs> um, if you want to just go ahead and move to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Can you go back? This, um, I wanted to just make note of the, the form line here was um, done by Corinne James. Um, and she, she created this design as, um, so that the image is the healing hands are feeding um, positive words into the face. Um, and so she painted that on my office wall um, and it's it's in several schools, um, but she designed it as a way to 
um, remind us educators um, to always be feeding our students um, good things and good words um, for them to carry with them. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that for Are us. Are there any posters of that? No posters, no. Um, but the Hatuch Lachish Coalition does um, pay her to come to schools and paint it on the walls. So um, if you, you're welcome to reach out, probably your principal can coordinate that. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So kids have a reputation for resilience, right? That's when people say, oh, kids are resilient. And part of the reason for that, that we just sort of think that is because we give a lot of weight to visual evidence. And we often have seen things like pictured here when a kiddo who scraped their nose on the ice is smiling again before the blood or tears have dried, mm -hmm. right? We see that physical bounce back from usually accidental harm is pretty quick. Um, however, that visual evidence can be misleading because in fact, kids in their emotional and brain development are pretty, uh, can be pretty vulnerable actually. And so it's important that we look at what builds resilience and recognize that resilience is variable. It's not like a fixed state, like, oh, a kid is resilient. Um, in this moment, this kid was resilient. We could go to the next slide. Um, on another day, <laughs> this kid may be having a meltdown. I don't remember the exact crisis that I took this picture in. And I do have permission for my child to have the photos in the presentation, by the way. Um, but you know, it's things like his banana broke, right? Like this is why there's a hashtag, hashtag why my kid is crying. It's the broken banana, it's she looked at me. It's that it's not tomorrow, you know? Now at 10, he's learned that a banana tastes the same even if it's broken in half. And eventually also of course learned that yesterday's tomorrow is today. <laughs> so we don't have to be sad that it's not tomorrow and what we were looking for is still not here. Um, even at 10, his sister looking at him the wrong way might still be a problem because resilience is variable on a day-to-day -day or moment-to-moment -moment basis. And it um, rests on a number of different factors. One of the things that really affects resilience for kids is the level of stress in their life. We could go to the next slide. Um, the presenter this morning, if you made it to the keynote, talked a little bit about that, what we know about toxic stress. So ACEs are events prior to age 18, which have been shown to impose sometimes damaging levels of stress on children's development. PACEs, positive childhood experiences, um, build a child's sense of belongingness and connection. Next slide. <laughs> um, I know in Juno and around Southeast, I think most folks are, have some familiar with a the ACEs study. Is that familiar to folks in the room? Show of hands. You've heard ACEs before or you haven't? Okay. So brief summary. In the late 1990s, a researcher from the CDC and one from um, Kaiser Permanente in San Diego, California, got together and did a study looking at 10 factors that they called adverse childhood experience, and that included physical, mental, and or physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, having a household member incarcerated, a household member with substance use, a household member with mental illness. Um, there's two more. There's 10. <laughs> um, oh, homelessness or divorce in the, for the household. What they learned, and it sort of shocked them, they didn't necessarily expect this, it was a retrospective study, so they were asking folks as adults what they'd experienced in childhood. They learned that there was a dose responsive or basically a directly correlated relationship between those 10 things and cancer, heart disease, asthma, a whole bunch of significant public health concerns that previously we weren't recognizing to be a result of stress on kids. Um, since then, folks have expanded on that beyond the 10 items and also to look at the community environment. So this pair of ACEs model adds adverse community environment, um, which includes disruption of your uh, community, lack of opportunity, um, things like that. Particularly in Alaska, it's important to consider that community disruption is often 
almost always a factor for our Alaska Native communities. And that might be due to colonization. Even in some communities at this point, climate change has required relocation or significant disruption in communities. Um, subsistence, lifestyle is impacted by climate change and habitat loss and all those things. All of that contributes to stress on a household and a family and the kids. Um, if you go to the next slide. There's really nothing magic about the 10 items of the ACES, original ACES study. What it taught us was the link between stress and brain development, right? That's the, the key is really that ACES was a relatively crude measure of toxic stress. So the way that brains and bodies and particularly developing brains and bodies respond to stress is the link between ACES and the negative outcomes that have been identified. The impacts that we know that has on child development is that it impacts their ability to emotionally regulate, right? And um, Dr. Robert talked about that this morning in terms of going to that fight, flight, freeze. If our stress system is always on, we go to fight, flight, freeze much more quickly than someone who's had the opportunity to live most of their life in a more safe feeling space. Um, that can lead to often high impulsivity, right? If we're not well regulated, we don't have good impulse control. Often leads to um, learning struggles, difficulties, emotional distress, and like I said, it's connected to mental and physical health challenges throughout the lifespan. One of the things that was really important about the ACEs study is that it helped us move from looking at what is wrong with, right? Previously, folks who suffered negative outcomes in adulthood, it was often like, well, they adopted negative coping behaviors. And it's true that high risk of ACEs puts you at higher risk for substance use and things like that. But one of the things that the ACEs study demonstrated was that someone who had a high ACEs score, who didn't smoke or drink or engage in risky activities was still at a higher risk of negative health outcomes. So the cause, again, was about the, the causal factor was the stress and the way it impacts development and not the adoption of health risk behaviors. Okay, go to the next slide. What the results of ACEs don't tell us is it's not a determination of destiny, right? This was a population level study, an epidemiological study. So out of 17,000 people, there was a very clear pattern, which means we can go, this is a public health concern, not individual problems. But doing an ACEs survey of every student in your class is really not helpful for you or for them because on an individual basis, you have no idea whether a high ACEs score is gonna lead to negative outcomes or not. On a population level, we see that pattern. We know we need to address it, but individually it's not predictive. The reason for that, or one of the reasons, is that the ACEs study didn't include looking at resilience and protective factors. So that original sort of oppressive paradigm was like, what is wrong with you? If you have negative health comes, if you struggle with mental health or homelessness, it's the individual problem. The trauma-informed or ACEs-informed perspective shifted to asking what happened to you, right? What were the things that impacted you along the way that you got here? Shifting one step further and looking towards healing-centered engagement, we'd rather ask what is right with you, right? Because everybody, even the most stressed child and family has strengths, right? And if we can focus on those strengths and lift them up, then that's the way that we build resilience for individuals and ultimately for our communities. Next slide. Um, and one thing to keep in mind as we do that, so resilience is our ability to manage emotions and feelings in a productive way. Sometimes we like to think, well, it's not our job in schools, right? In schools, we're here to teach reading, writing, math, and music. Um, and I love this quote from uh, Ray Fisher and Smith. And if you were in service last year, we heard, this is Dominique Smith, who we heard from, um, in their book, All Learning is Social and Emotional. And they say, because teachers unquestionably influence students' social and emotional development, they have a responsibility to do so in a way that is positive and deliberate. And so I'm going to offer you the opportunity to reflect for a minute. If you've ever had the realization 
that you were teaching something to kids that you had not intended to teach to kids. <laughs> um, you know, and work with kids. When, when you realize that they were learning something from what you were doing sort of unconsciously or just implicitly, um, and if you'd like to share with your neighbor around that topic, take a couple minutes to do that. If you prefer to reflect individually, that's okay too. I know that can be a... Often what we realize we were teaching unintentionally isn't always a positive. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Um, but if you want to reflect on that, make note or share with a neighbor, got a couple minutes for that. Okay. All right, you tend to wrap up your conversations. I hate to cut off folks who are engaged in learning together. You can bring your attention back. Thank you. Um, let's see, we should go to the next slide. Um, so these are the social emotional competencies that Juno School District uses. Most districts around the state have some version of this. Some have all five of the castle competencies and many follow. This is the um, Anchorage did an adaptation of castle and lots of districts around the state just adopted these as did Juno. Um, and it's that we look at self-awareness and self-management, social awareness and social management. Really underlying all of those SEL competencies is self-regulation. Uh, go to the next slide, Nicole. So that's the process of managing thoughts and feelings to enable goal-directed behavior. And it plays an important role in supporting well-being across the lifespan. Self-regulation is both a neurophysiological process and a learned skill. We learn self-regulation when we have the opportunity to experience emotions while in safe connected relationship with an adult and to process that experience in safe connected relationship. And I just, um, I was thinking about this slide this morning as I was like, having all the anxiety about having to come talk in front of people. <laughs> um, and it's just, it occurred to me that um, those don't develop at the same time. The neurophysical, um, physiological processes don't necessarily develop at the same time as your learning process. And so I have learned a ton of skills, right? But I was still, I still had a headache. I still felt nauseous. I still like was, you know, all hyped up. Um, but I was able to stay regulated because I've learned enough skills to know that's just my body reacting. Um, so I just think it's, it's good to remember that just because you're feeling anxiety doesn't mean that you can't learn the skills to, to stay productive in your space. <laughs> so co-regulation happens at a physiological level. One of the keys is the adult self-awareness of our own physiological state. Um, the best way of seeing co-regulation at work that um, I like to use for illustrating is if you have ever been trying to put a small child to sleep, right? <laughs> Lots of folks have done that. And on a day when you're just pretty chill and relaxed, it'd be nice if they took a nap, but it doesn't really matter if they take a nap. They're probably going to just Pull right to sleep because you're calm and chill and they can call regulate to that and settle into sleep. On the day when you really need this kid to sleep because you need a break or you have to get dinner going because there's something happening later or whatever your reason is, when you really need it to happen, <laughs> it will be so much harder for that child to go to sleep because they are, again, co-regulating to your energy level and your energy is not calm and peaceful and sleep encouraging. It's sort of anxious and activated. Um, that's a really easy way to say it, see it. Another place we see it is with little kids. You've probably seen this even if you just have ever watched kids on a playground and a kid falls and they turn and look at the adult with them. Yeah. And if the adult goes, oh my God, are you okay? <laughs> they burst into tears. <laughs> and if the adult says, whoops, are you all right? They might be just fine. Like they, they might even be bleeding a little, but still be fine. And again, they are co-regulating with the adult. Oh my gosh, mom's upset by this? Yeah, it must be really bad. <laughs> or, oh, oh, okay, things are okay. I didn't like that, but I'm okay. Um, we see it really easily in little kids. It applies throughout the lifespan, right? Our dysregulation, and the ease with which we can regulate in different spaces and with different people 
is a process that is always a factor in our lives. Um, next slide. So we best support co-regulation when we can have a supportive process between adults and youth that is characterized by these three kinds of support. When we have, uh, can develop warm and stable relationships, when we have created, cre when we have created supportive and safe environments, and when we can coach and model those self-regulation skills. Um, often it's been popular in education to sort of discourage teachers from having their feelings in their classroom. But the reality is we all have feelings all the time. They're with us. They can be activated or we can be well-regulated, but they're there. And when we can acknowledge that and name it, we give kids vocabulary for their emotions and we model managing our emotions. Right? If we can say, wow, I'm feeling frustrated with whatever, but we can do it in a calm way, then that might be the first time that a kid has ever seen an adult be frustrated and kind, right? If you can express your frustration in a peaceful way, productive way that's setting boundaries, many kids don't ever see that at home. And so the idea that you could be frustrated and kind may not even have existed as a possibility in their mind unless they see it remodeled from within well, outside the home. So using emotional literacy language is part of how we develop co-regulation for kids and relationships with kids. Right? If we have feelings, it must be okay for them to have feelings. We never have feelings in the classroom. Gosh, I guess you can't have feelings in the classroom. That feels really stressful. I have feelings sometimes, you know? I think we could go to the next slide. So again, it develops in the context of relationship and our ability to be with kids. And I define being with sort of two different ways. Sometimes when we're talking with someone, and you might think about this too in adult friendships, right? Whether we're allowing someone to have their feelings or whether you're joining them in those feelings, right? If you're upset by something and you're talking with a friend and they say, right, they jump right in it with you. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you. If I were you, I would just, it might feel good in the moment, but is it gonna help you to deal productively with that situation? Mm, generally not. If they can allow you to have that feeling, gosh, it's really frustrating. I can see why you would be upset, but they don't join you in your agitation. You're likely to return to a more regulated state, be able to think creatively about problem solving. If they are with you and let you have your feeling, not trying to talk you out of it, not minimizing the experience. Um, and again, so the example, right? If we can say to a kid, this is hard. Man, I see you're really having a hard time with this. That lets them have the feeling, it validates the feeling. Often we have this impulse to say, it's okay, which we mean to be reassuring, but can come off as sort of invalidating or discouraging that expression of emotion. Sometimes you might think it's okay, but it really doesn't feel okay to me. And so if you tell me that it's okay and I really don't feel okay, then we're not connecting in a productive way. Next slide. So again, exists throughout the lifetime. I love this quote, social connections are the most powerful way for us to regulate our emotional distress. If you're in distress, being in proximity to someone you are securely attached to is the most effective way to calm yourself. And that exists at whatever age we are. Um, I had an experience of this very, like noticed it, right? Because I've been training this for a couple of years. And then a few years ago, I got a text from my parents who live in California, wildfire country, that there was a new fire start. So it wasn't like we'd been keeping an eye on something, we had an idea there was a new fire start less than a mile from my childhood home, which sits in the middle of a forest. And whew, my system activated, I was dysregulated, I was stressed out. Of course, there was nothing productive I could do. I'm in Alaska there in California, nothing at all I can do to be helpful to the situation. And I reached out to a friend who lives up the street. And she said, do you want to go for a walk around the block or come sit on my porch and have a glass of wine? And I said, yes, I do. And actually, we just walked around the block. 
And we didn't even talk about the fire and what was happening and where my parents evacuated, but just being in the presence of a friend I felt safe with helped me to like bring my nervous system back down and move productively through the rest of the things I needed to do for the day. Um, and if you reflect on that, you probably can think of times in your own life when something is dysregulated and you were distressed and what someone did didn't necessarily matter as much as just having the presence of someone that felt safe. Uh, again, the keynote talked right about belonging and connection as part of how we create safety. Uh, and that's true for everybody at every age, ideally. Now, it's true that trauma response can make it hard for kids to connect. And so it may take a lot of being really present with kids in a very accepting way and not necessarily expecting them to reciprocate for a while, but just not taking their dysregulation personally. If you can maintain your own regulation in their presence, eventually they'll come to see you as safe. Next. The other distinction I think is important is that being regulated isn't necessarily the absence of fake feelings. Um, when we start to talk about and understand dysregulation, I sometimes hear things like, well, kids just come in from recess totally dysregulated. And some kids may be coming in from recess dysregulated because they have bad interaction and they are activated and in fight, flight, freeze mode. But often they're coming in from recess upregulated. <laughs> Their energy is high. Upregulation and downregulation in appropriate context are not good or bad, right? Sometimes it's good to be more energized. Now we might want to keep in mind those times when they're more upregulated and use a transition activity. I'm sure some of you already use those strategies. If you try to come straight from recess to a quiet journaling reflection, that may not go super productively. But if you can have an activity that sort of brings it back to a circle and shares a reflection in some way and then moves to a calmer activity so that they've had an opportunity to bring down their, their energy level a little bit. Um, but I sometimes, sometimes I see that we tend towards repressing emotion in the name of regulation and they're really two completely different things. Um, regulation, right, is managing our emotions productively. If I'm pretending I don't have this feeling, it's really hard to manage it. Okay, um, so I let Marissa take over all of the <laughs> all of the really hard stuff. Um, <laughs> um, but I wanted to jump in here and talk about protective factors. Um, that's where the these cards kind of came from. Is um, just thinking about how, as a family advocate in our district, I'm working with families often who are experiencing barriers to their educational or life goals. Um, due to systemic oppression, due to a million different things. Um, and, and so, and like Marissa said, when we can help people see and when we can reflect back their strengths, then it allows them to um, come into regulation, build connection um, and, and improves resiliency, right? Um, and so the, the CDC has all of these, you know, things on their website of, of things that they have collected data around um, that, that seem to protect people from long-term impacts of trauma. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, I really liked the, the Center for the Study of Social Policy kind of narrowed all those more individual level um, practices into, into these five. Um, and and I highlighted the two that I feel like within the schools, we have the most sort of power to, to engage with. Um, so parents having the knowledge of parenting and child development is, um, is something that teachers, I've seen teachers in my building at Harborview do as far as um, letters home or um, family nights where we say, here's what, you know, you can expect to see from your kiddo throughout this year of development um, and, and to give some, some sort of guidelines so that parents are, under, are able to understand, um, you know, a, a six-year-old is gonna be developmentally capable of different things than an eight-year-old. 
uh, if you want to go to the next one. So the the there's some examples here of things that we can do in the in the school setting um, to nurture that some ideas. And I also just wondered if we wanted to take a few minutes and um, talk through some ways that, and if you want to switch to the next one too, um, some ways that we can do social emotional competence with children. So um, I know that we're already doing these things in the school setting. Um, and I'm hopeful that we can break up into just, just kind of who you're around um, and talk about what tools you've used in your practice. Um, and then we'll take a couple minutes to share out some, some ideas that we've heard um, of, of how are you engaging the uh, helping parents understand the, the emotion or the, sorry, <laughs> um, parenting and child development systems, and then the social emotional competence of children. I think it's also really important to think about how these can be different across cultures, right? And so our goal with acknowledging protective factors and um, promotive factors is not that we can take stock of families and say, oh, you don't have any protective factors, so you need all of my help. Um, it's, it's having, it's being a mirror basically for the families to reflect and kids to reflect back to you what they say, see as their strengths, where they, where they find hope, where they find joy, where they find laughter, um, where they find resilience, right? And so when you're thinking through these, um, what you do in your classroom, it's just um, important to be mindful that, that your answers are gonna be different um, across cultures that, of, of families that you're working with. So we'll give you maybe five minutes for discussion. <laughs> right, I mean, can, can it be, uh, I, I talked a little bit about just making space for the social emotional conversations and support, like in my classroom, mm -hmm. but also admittedly, like, um, I'm at the high school level, especially in my connection to the parents, it's, it's not, I, I'm not often talking about their students' development. Um, Probably not often enough, really. Like I could do it more, and, I, and I'm working on that. But I also I don't know. Uh, the conversation is kind of something different too, and it, it becomes a lot more. People are asking more about their academics a lot at, at the high school level. Although I I, mean, I don't think that these social emotional things disappear by any means. But I'm um, gonna stop rambling. Uh, Thank you. Kind of, uh, no, that's important. One of the things that I think about often with the older age groups is I often hear parents who are like frustrated that they just don't seem to understand the important right or the long term ramifications or the need to focus or whatever. And that's where I, like developmentally, it's true. They don't understand the long term ramifications. Their brain literally hasn't wired that piece yet. And, like, right. And so helping parents have that appropriate expectation of like, no, when, when kids are in high school, their brains have not wired. The future thinking piece is particularly not back online. Um, I have a friend who talks about child development. She goes, no, you go through the toddler years and, you know, survive that in preschool. And then there's just really kind of sweet years in upper elementary where like their brains are working pretty well. She said, and then you get to adolescence and it's like you started back over at one but they're just bigger. <laughs> and developmentally, that's very much what happens in brains, right? We hit adolescence, we get another huge burst of growth, lots of new neurons that aren't talking to each other very well yet. And it takes sort of the whole course of adolescence for our brains to wire all those new neurons into a functioning system that lets us think about consequences and results and the future. So. Yeah, like developmentally, the process of adolescence is actually very similar to the process of early childhood. They're just bigger and can make bigger mistakes with bigger consequences. They don't really have a better understanding of the mistakes and consequences. They're just not big. <laughs> Anybody else have anything they want to share out? We talked a little bit about the need to reconnect with families after these last couple of years. Um, just that, like things like family nights would be great to get those going again so that you can offer that information. But also, how do you do it most successfully? Because I think everyone is burned out 
of the last couple of years, and especially thinking about elementary age um, students, but they, those families that basically had to be in charge of education for their child for quite a bit of time. And I think that a lot of those families want to step back now. And so how do you re-engage them also deeply? And so that they want to be engaged in those ways. Mm -hmm. Which is perfect, but that brings us to our very next slide <laughs> um, of the relationship based work of individual and community healing can only move at the speed of trust. And so as we start to engage families um, and build trust, that's when we can start um, having those restorative relationships together. Um, but trust moves slow <laughs> um, and with good reason, right? Um, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you speak to it. Well, many families, of course, have negative history with schools, whether it's cultural or just individual. Um, and so, right, we have sort of, we're, it, with many families, we're starting at a disadvantage and trying to build trust in the school system. And so again, being mindful of our own self-regulation, not taking it personally when a family has distrust with the system, recognizing that yeah, if every family has a hard time with you, maybe you want to engage in all the self-reflection. <laughs> but in general, if like a family is difficult to connect with, it's probably not really personal. It's about their history and previous experiences. And if you can continue to show up and be regulated in your conversations with them, right? That's we create a sense of safety when people can be physiologically regulated with whatever we're bringing. And that's true for students, and that's true for parents, it's true for our colleagues, right? You probably all know that person in the building that you go to when you're a little agitated because just talking with them or stepping in their room for a minute helps you feel better. That's someone who's got strong self-regulation skills. You can come in with agitation, and they can keep their calm and stay grounded, and you can come into grounding with them. And so being aware of the things that activate us. I mean, when you start having conversation with kids and families, you may hear things that are a bit activating for you, for your own history, or just because they're challenging circumstances. Right? Lots of families that we work with are really facing incredible challenges. And if we can hear that and we can let them have their feelings without trying to talk them out of it or becoming upset ourselves, we strengthen our relationships when we can maintain regulation in whatever we're bringing. I think along the lines of, you know, the, the building that trust and the family nights and coming out of, you know, COVID is just speaking like, you know, from a parent because I'm not a teacher, but, you know, and I, I think it's really applicable here is, is um, making sure that you're reaching out um, with positives um, because I feel like if you only reach out to parents when there's something negative, um, regardless of whether where they're at with that trust, um, it's going to be so much harder. You know, to, to get to a space that's productive. And um, and one of our group members here was talking about um, a texting. Um, oh, remind. Remind. And so it doesn't even have to be a phone call. I mean, it, like a text or a note home or something is, um, it means so much to get that. And so it's not just, you know, um, where there's an issue or, um, you know, and even educational, you know, just having that something positive about and I know that some teachers have 33 students, so maybe, but texting, I don't know, that seems like a really nice text to get. Because <laughs> I don't know if family nights are, you know, I mean, how quickly that can help them, but I guess just in thinking of other ways. Yeah. I mean, and another way that we build trust, and in, um, Elizabeth was talking about engaging parents, is letting, seeing their whole child, right? If, if parents are wanting to step back, right, from engagement in school, it's because there's like they see school as separate, right? If we can help them see school and their child's experience at school and home as all part of a whole, then they're, they're already engaged in half of that. So if we can bring those halves together, then we've engaged them in the whole, right? And so looking at those things, again, that help us make connection, not necessarily just about academics, but about the whole child reduces that sense of separation with parents at school. When I started teaching middle school, I identified some of the toughest kids in the class, which is easy, easy to do. <laughs> and I would make two or three phone calls a day. 
from the kids. Okay? And just to tell the parent, you know, something that is something specific that I've seen in the child that day in interaction with me, with another student, the work they did, didn't matter. Positive. And I think parents break down crying and say that this is the first time that uh, a teacher has told them something. And what happened with them, they all ended up being an advocate for me when I needed it with their child. Um, they were on my side, and, but it was their child. And I hadn't, I didn't, I never faced them. I hadn't face to face with these parents. It was all over the telephone. And that taught me something. It was a, it was a trick in a way. I knew, <laughs> and I knew it was, but I also, I thought it was going to, well worth Well, and I think it maybe felt like a trick because we're so used to like damage control, right? Yeah. Like that's kind of how our fast paced system works is like, um, if you're not causing any problems, good. <laughs> if you are, I need it to stop right now and I'm going to do the quickest thing, right? And so when you take that little bit of ahead of the time to, to highlight and lift up the strengths of the kid um yeah that's that's how we build and i would like to add that this was in the 80s wow the late 80s and, and those kids are all adults now and i see and we have positive relationships some die you know some are doing poorly some are doing well but the interactions are always good Um, so on that, one thing that I did in my, in my role at Harborview was to, um, develop these, these story cards. Um, and I feel, I have to just say, I feel very awkward talking about storytelling while Frank Tons is in the room. <laughs> Two, professional Two professional storytellers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I am not a professional storyteller by any means. Um, but I wanted a way to get to know family strengths and a way that um, that knowledge could seep into classrooms with classroom teachers um, and peers and, and all of that. And so um, I studied the protective factors that are listed you know, online um, and I developed some questions to ask kids. Um, initially, I had developed this as an interview process to do with families. I wanted, I had this vision of like inviting families to have tea and talk about all the ways their family is awesome, right? Um, and what I found is that vulnerability is very hard when you haven't built trust yet. <laughs> and even talking about your strengths is vulnerable. Um, and so even families who I know personally who do this kind of work were kind of like shifty about wanting to sit down for this interview, right? Like it was not comfortable. Um, and kids are really excited to tell you about themselves um, often. And so I use these cards. I ask kids, I use them in group settings. I use them in individual settings. Um, the key that I've done is when a kid tells me a story, then I call or email the family and say, I heard the coolest story about your family today, right? Because then they know, wow, that person sees the best of my family. And that's what we need, right? <laughs> um, and when we do it in small groups with kids, then kids get to hear each other's bets. And so then they're, they're building these deeper relationships together. Um, and so I just wanted to give us some time. And like I said, I know it can feel vulnerable, so no pressure. You can keep it as light or as deep as you want. Um, but I think it's good practice for us to kind of go through these questions um, and just in the whatever small groups you've been talking to, just kind of where you're at is fine um, and, and what you're comfortable with. Some people in some groups, I ask everybody to, um, I invite everybody to talk to the same card in other groups. You pick, each person picks a different card. Um, it's really, you don't have to speak to anything you don't feel comfortable with. This is all about just um, finding ways to connect over our strengths and, and the things that make our, um, our families brilliant and amazing. Um, and so I think 
let's see how much time we have now. Three of them. We have about 20 minutes um, to just kind of sit and, and chat together um, and about about the stories that spark from these these question prompts. So there you go. <laughs> is is that how you you use them in a classroom or teachers use them in a classroom? I think the kids just sort of pick pick one and, and talk to each other. So I I don't have they're not in classrooms yet. They they just got printed. <laughs> I just picked them up yesterday. Um, and so I don't know how if there is a, a way that would work better than others in a classroom setting. I know when I have small groups of up to seven kiddos, um, I very much just it's pretty kiddo led. Um, I have the cards on my table. Sometimes they just walk over and want to start telling these stories. Um, and and other times I use it for a kid, you know, like you said, you can pick out the kids that are that are having a hard time. So, um, you know, before I ever get called in to interact with a kiddo who is dysregulated, I'm going to be having these conversations. The teachers know who's going to who's on that edge, right? The teachers know that's it's part of it. And so um, I ask those teachers to to let me know who they're kind of concerned might, right? And we start building that relationship before anything even happens. So that when when it does, when or if it does, they know this person. Okay, they know that I did this thing, right? But they also know this other really cool story about me, um, which which has built trust, right? Um, so yeah, I, I don't have a best practice in classrooms. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, well, I was just I'm just thinking about maybe yeah go and I was thinking that. Up. And I think specifically about the school you work at, which is a responsive classroom school, but during morning meeting, these are amazing prompts that yeah. you can get that would spark conversation with the community. That's what Marissa um, had, had shared yeah. as well. Yeah. And you can either write it on the board or it could be a journal prompt for me. Yeah, thank you for that. I also just really, as a neurodivergent person myself, people communicate and process stories so differently. And so, um, having opportunities to draw pictures, do art in response to the questions, write the story, tell the story, tell the story to me, tell the story to a friend where I'm not listening. I mean, there's there's lots of different ways you can make this accessible um, depending on the way the kiddo's brain is wired for connection. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I would say too, Michelle, I mean, often people ask when we do the restorative practice training, like, do you have a bank of questions? Mm -hmm. You have a bank of questions. <laughs> you know, and some of these are the deeper level questions, right? I wouldn't necessarily start with, you know, oh, it's time someone helped your family on day one of the high school class. <laughs> but right. once you've built some trust and you're going to use some, some deeper get to know you questions, these are a really good resource for that. Yeah. And some of them, right? You could probably ask, you know, what's something you've learned how to make from someone in your family? Mm -hmm. That's a pretty low risk mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Draw a card. Draw a card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. So how did that go for everybody? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you get yeah. some stories out of each other? <laughs> Months, right? <laughs> yeah. Same. It's clear there's a lot of thought going into this. A lot of thought. It must have taken you quite. I mean, I would think it would. Yeah, it was kind of an interesting process. So I actually got the idea during the Through the Cultural Lens um, course that the Alaska Institute um, offers. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then it wasn't until like a solid year later that I had come to this final product. <laughs> yeah, it took a while. I would think it would be really smart to spend a lot of time with them so you know what they are. Mm -hmm. And that way you can customize it. And I think that's really good. I do have one question, and I'm not picking out any of the cards, but if you have a student that is uncomfortable with the question, what would you recommend um, passing or maybe yeah. giving them another card to respond to? Or? Yeah, so if until I've built up 
trust with kids, often what I'll do is I'll just lay them all face up on a table and they can pick which one so that they can see and sign up for the one that they want to share too. Yeah. And I'd say like, you're going to use them in a group and you don't have a ton of trust yet. Like you could do two, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And so then they can make a choice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, you could use them as your talking piece for a circle, yeah. right? And then somebody can just look at the card and read the question and talk to the card if that's yeah. what they're ready for. And passing is, in trauma engaged practice, passing should always be an option. Yeah. 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 Right. So, um, how do we get a hold of, like, if we want um, class set or something? Um, well, the district purchased a hundred. Um, so there are, and that's just kind of first come first serve, I think. <laughs> um, and, and then I, I guess the schools, individual schools could probably purchase more from me. I'm not yeah. sure. So just email you. Yeah, that would um, be great. Okay. So you could even like ask the district if they had a class that they could, if I emailed you, you would take care of I can, I can ask for sure i don't know what their funding is or you know no i mean um, but, like their hundred if they might like let our english department have a class set oh, right that uh -huh. we pass around and share right right you yeah. know that kind of thing yeah yeah i guess we haven't really um decided so yeah that's helpful yes okay. I definitely um are you gonna have y'all's email addresses up there in a minute no I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> did we have for the last one? Oh, I guess I did. Was I was like, I could turn to that. I did that on the last one. There's a marker. Do you mind putting it on the board? The whiteboard? Yeah. <laughs> whiteboard, not the projector screen. Right. Not, <laughs> not, 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 not to make enemies <laughs> on end service day one. <laughs> Although that would make me laugh so hard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sort of. And didn't we learn this morning that laughter is normal? Yes. Yep. Any other comments, questions about the cards, ideas of how you might use them in your spaces? One of my classes we do on Monday is social emotional learning. We spend some time with social emotional learning. Um, I think uh, having prompts like these questions would help like sort of drive the conversation for the day. So it'd be something like coming into the classroom and having this projected, at least some of these questions projected up on the board to help, you know, get them thinking about what, what we're going to talk about. And a lot of times it's like, what did we all do this weekend? You know, because if you try to, sometimes questions can be a little bit too heavy and they're like, eh. so yeah. you're like, anyone see any movies? They're like, I saw the new, you know, right. Jason movie. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> But uh, you know, having prompts like this might be good to kind of weave in every once in a while, see if we can get them to open up what they use. I guess I um, I just remembered too that I wanted to mention that I have had some. Well, all of these questions are very intentionally geared to point towards strengths. There have been some really heavy, hard conversations that have come from these as well, and so. Um, just being aware that you might hear some stuff that's hard to sit with when you when you use these, um, and and that's the opportunity, right, to practice that self regulation because um, it can still be an incredibly powerful tool to build trust, but it might not, you know, you might get some some different sort of um, stories that that are powerful in their own right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe so. Yeah, I really have um, enjoyed sort of mixing the art and the and the trauma informed practices um, stuff. So there might be some more things that that come out, and hopefully the district will continue to <laughs> to engage with them. <laughs> yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions? We're, it looks like we're at the end here and of our time. Um, and so we have a 15 minute question and answer if anybody has questions for Marissa or I about the content um, or about how you might implement any of this stuff in your classrooms. 
Um, otherwise, it's the end of the conference, and you can totally take off. Right. Right. End of the day. Right. Right. So right. End of the day. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.